All right, welcome to church. Glad you're here. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them, pull them out. We're uh, walking through the Psalms this summer, looking at the songs of the saints, the essential soundtrack. You guys remember a TV show, Don't Forget the Lyrics? You guys remember that reality show where like, everybody had to like, try to finish the lyric and remember? I think it's important this summer, what, what we're really doing is kind of looking back at these songs that have been a part of the people of God for centuries trying to recall and remember as we look at the lyrics of them, allowing them to kind of encourage and shape and mold some of the essential things of our life, the essential components of our faith, moving us in that direction. And so that's what we're, we're doing. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm 91 today. If you would, as we do most often, would you stand to your feet as we honor the Word of God. I'll read it out. You can follow along there in front of you or on the screen. We stand for a couple reasons. One, to remind ourselves to give honor and precedence to God's Word, but also to remind ourselves that it is um, with our bodies that we obey and integrate and live out these truths that we agree with. And that's what we're reminding ourselves as we stand here in this moment. So Psalm 91, I'll read, you follow along. This is the word of the Lord. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers and he will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Don't be afraid of the terrors of the night nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side and though 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the most high your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. They will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, you can be seated. When turmoil and storms hit, especially when here in the Midwest, when there's a a tornado approaching. They say there's a warning. Maybe the sirens are going off. The, the common wisdom is that we would then find a place of shelter and kind of shelter in place. Have you heard this phrase before? Shelter in place. This idea of finding a safe place out of the way of the storm and staying there, sheltering there until you get the all clear, until everything is kind of Past till all the winds have died down, all of the, the chaos around has kind of subsided. Then you can come out. But, but until then, just shelter in place. Uh, this is the idea I want to talk to us about as we examine the lyrics of this song in Psalm 91, that, that we would shelter in place. Uh, this week, um, as I was preparing and, and reading uh, this text, I, I sent Taylor a message and I said, hey, could the worship team do this song? I, I don't do that often. I, I do it on occasion. And, uh, but this particular week, I just really, uh, some, some lyrics of a, of a modern song just continued to kind of like echo in my heart. Have you ever had a song stuck in your head? Right? Like it's just a lyric that just keep is on repeat in a loop almost. And 
And I think uh, we, when we have songs like that, um, what we're really doing in that moment, whether you realize it or not, is you're actually meditating on that, on that truth. You're meditating on that thought, which, which means that the, the, the things that you're listening to really are helping shape your thought process. And if you want to shift your thought process, because maybe your thought process has been full of anxiety and worry and stress and doubt and frustrations and selfishness and self-indulgences, and then change what you're listening to. It kind of helps shift that focus. In fact, last week in, in the first service, I issued a challenge to our church, and uh, I failed to do it in the second service, so you got a bypass on this. But I'm challenging all of you. If this is your church and I'm your pastor, I want to challenge you on something. For the month of July, listen to only worship music. I, I like triple dog dare you to tune in and listen to worship music only. Nothing, nothing. It's not like I'm not trying to make some statement of morality against other genres of music. I, that's not really my point. My point is, that when you recognize that often these lyrics to these worship songs, what they're actually doing is helping shape and form and orient your theology and your thoughts to align with who God is. And there's something vital about our thoughts being in alignment with who God is. And this week, uh, one, of the verses, one of the songs I asked the team to do was that second song. That song, There's Another in the Fire. The, the, the lyrics go like this. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Ever feel like your heart and your soul and everything in you is just under fire? Under, under this, 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 this attack, this, this pressure, this, this thing to where like there is nothing at ease within you? There, when, when your heart is under fire, it says, there's another way when the walls are closing in, and I know I will never be alone. There is another way to respond when storms and calamity and trials and pressures come your way. There is a right way and a wrong way. There is another way to find yourself knowing you're not alone. The chorus goes like this. There'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how good you've been to me, I'll count the joy from every past battle because I know that's where you'll be. There's another in the fire. This, this idea, this idea of having another person in the fire is actually a, a biblical idea. It comes from uh, the story in the book of Daniel of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three Hebrew boys who refused to give their allegiance and submit their loyalty to a earthly king who was demanding worship and instead stood up in fidelity and loyalty to Yahweh and say, we will not bow our knee and worship and give our affection and our attention to you, O king, because our attention, our affection, our loyalty, our fidelity, our allegiance belongs to Yahweh alone. So they threw them in a fiery furnace. They cranked it up really hot, threw the boys in. And what you found in that story, if you read it in Daniel, in the very uh, kind of beginning parts of, of the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, uh, they were there in the fire. And all of a sudden, they're like, hey, didn't we throw three dudes in the fire? And they're like, yeah, king, there was three. We can count one, two, three. I don't, I don't even need my toes. I just know it's one, two, and three. And they're like, then why do I see four people? Because the Lord himself showed up in the fire with them. And there was a protection that God did a miraculous thing. Because their heart and their loyalty was undivided. They refused to allow the pressure to move and shift their loyalty and trust away from Yahweh. They kept it focused on God. 
this is what this song, Psalm 91, is kind of, the lyrics are telling us. They're telling us that there is fire and trouble that comes, but there is a place of protection, a shelter in place, a place of shelter, if you will, that we can go and we can experience some things from God. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Here's the first thing I want us to see from this, this song, and that's this. Number one, there is a place of protection. Place of protection. Turn to your me say there's a place of protection. In the first seven verses, we, we see this begin to list out, and we, and we see that there's a protection, and there's an armor, and, and there are things that are coming, and, and he's telling us to, to, to live, to abide, to remain in the place where Almighty is. Where, where the Most High lives is the place of protection. I love um, in the New King James, which is kind of how I memorized the first part of this when, when I was uh, growing up, it says it like this, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. I love this idea of the secret place. I don't know if you were like this growing up. Uh, did you ever have like a secret hideout? Like a, a little clubhouse that was just like you and your friends, and it was this hideout. But like, and most most of us who had a place like that, uh, there was either a secret handshake or a password that you needed in order to get in. Like, like it's the He Man Woman Haters Club, and you ain't getting in unless you know like the whole high sign, right? Like, there's this. That's an old school reference for some of you little rascal fans. Some of you are like little what? It's fine. Just Google it. It'll be all right. But later. In order to get into the secret place, you need the secret passcode. The, the psalmist is using this language of a place where God is dwelling, where you can go and find protection, but there's only one way in. Psalm 100 and verse 4 tells us how we get into the place where God is. It says it this way, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. Here's what I want us to understand, that it's in the secret place, the place where God is dwelling, his dwelling place, wherever God is, that's where we gain strength and wisdom to face the trouble and calamity and the storms that are raging. It's in his presence that that happens. It's, it's being where he is that that happens. The reason why I, I think it's important that we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, I, I, I think sometimes we think that like, okay, if I use the right words, then I'm like going to transcend to something. That, that's not really how it works. When we begin to use our words to describe and ascribe honor, glory, and majesty to his name. When we get to praise and we worship him, when we use our words to affirm the truth of, of who God is, well, here, here's what happens. It's not so much that like, um, like God leaves heaven and then now is here and he's only in one place at a time because we know God is everywhere all the time. What happens though in reality is that your awareness shifts from you to him. And the more aware you are of him, the more you'll notice him at work all around you. This is why it's important when we're worshiping to sing with your own words so that you have an awareness that God is present, not so that you're entertained by other people in their worship. I love Brother Norman. He's like my one amen section in this place. Like... And I told him, I was like, you just keep them coming. Because here's what I know. S somebody asked me recently, like, why do we say amen? Like, why would we do that in, in church? H here's why. Because it is with your mouth you begin to make agreement with the truth that you're hearing. Some of us are process we're processing, processing. But when you recognize something as true and you agree with you say amen, you say yes, 
amen is a word that means let it be, so be it. Like I'm, I'm wanting that to occur. When you recognize, wait, there's a place of protection, amen, I want some of that. There's an activation inside of you as you accept the truth. It begins to sink into your heart, so then you begin to live out that truth. Because faith has two legs. Faith has two sides of its same coin. On one side of the coin, it's agreeing with the truth of who God is. On the other side of the coin, it's your, um, it's your action in response to the truth that you believe. Faith without works is absolutely dead and pointless. So you can think all the right things, but do all the wrong things. You're not living in faith. You're living with a good concept of yourself, but you're not living in because faith is this, it's a two-legged thing. So it's not just this intellectual agreement of something. And so when we're hearing these songs, we're recognizing, wait a second, I am now allowed describing and ascribing, and I'm with my own words using the passcode, which now allows me to become more aware of God's presence. And when God's presence is here, there's something that is gained. Scri scripture says that it's in his presence we find fullness of joy, and it's the joy of the Lord that brings us strength. I've said it so many times, friends, as a church. If you want to have strength to endure the trouble you're facing, get in God's presence because his presence brings you joy and his joy gives you strength to deal with the junk you're dealing with. And many of us don't have strength in our faith. Our fidelity and our loyalty is shaky. We're not living like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're bowing and giving our loyalty and our allegiance to other powers and things around us rather than living in loyalty to him. And in that place and in that spot, we find ourselves feeling weak and not tapping into the strength of the spirit that God wants to give us in that place. See, it's in the secret place that I begin to develop trust in the sovereign one. Rather than living under the shadow of shame, I'm living in the shadow of the almighty. And I'm living and I'm dwelling with him. It, uh, look at towards the end of this. It says like, do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. The, the thousand would fall at your side, ten thousand. It's not going to touch you. It's not going to harm you. Like here in Psalm ninety-one, as is elsewhere throughout the Scriptures, like in say Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight, where many of us know God works all things for the good, where God's working something in our midst. In Romans eight, just like here in Psalms ninety-one. The promise of the scripture is not a promise and security from. It's actually a promise and security within. It's not that we need to walk with some arrogance to say, if I had real faith, no trouble would come near me. No, it's that when trouble comes near me, it doesn't prosper and succeed. I'm protected in the midst of trouble. Right? It, Isaiah says it like this, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Doesn't mean there are no weapons formed coming at you. Because there are. There's trouble. Jesus told us, we talked about it last week. He said, take heart. Because in this world, you're going to find some trouble. It's coming for you. Things that you didn't want to happen, happened. In the middle of those seasons, know there is a place of protection, of preservation where the Lord is with you. Friends, the divorce is not the end. The sickness is not the end. The addiction is not the end. The loss of income is not your end. The relationship lost is not your end. The betrayal and the rejection is not the end. The reality of those things happening in your life and in my life are not an indication of God's judgment specifically to you or his lack of love for you. If we're waiting for our faith to be circumstantial, our faith is not, our trust is not in him, it's in circumstances. Our trust is in him, regardless of circumstance. 
And that's the promise of God. That no matter what you face, and you're going to face some stuff, He's going to give you protection and be with you in those things. It's not a lack of faith when you get sick. It's a question of will you remain loyal to him in the face of not feeling well? <laughs> will I actually sing and worship him if I'm feeling a little tired and sluggish? Or am I going to let my praise of him be dictated by my feelings about how well I slept last night? Like it's, 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 am I going to wait to be loyal to him when I'm experiencing rejection from the people that I'm seeing? Am I going to start acting in a way that's going to defend my name, gossip about them, get back at them, look for vindication on them? Or, or am I just going to walk in a place to say, God, this hurts. I don't like it. I don't understand it. But my eyes are staying on you. And I'm going to, in those moments, find myself in the very presence of God where I can find strength to keep moving forward. I remember several years ago, I was on staff in North Carolina, and um, there were, uh, uh, through a, a very um, just odd series of events, some deep misunderstandings um, and assumptions were being made about me that were not true. And uh, the people who were making those assumptions were not silent or quiet about those assumptions. It, oh, yeah. In church, like this is church people. I know it shocks. I know it's like, can't believe it. Yeah, it's deep, deep things. And I remember absolutely feeling betrayed, broken, crushed. I didn't know what to do. The idea of being misunderstood, you've heard me share before, is one of those deeply unsettling things. And it was a prolonged season in my life. Can I tell you one of the verses that just kept me moving? Psalm 91 and verse 1. I just kept saying, Lord, wherever you are, I'm going to be. I'm safe in your presence. I'm going to be here with you and you're here with me. And I, I want your presence more than I want to be right and vindicated. I want you in my life in this moment more than anything else. And eventually God kind of worked some things out and he did some pretty amazing things and some humorous things that I was like, ha, thanks, Lord, that was fun. I appreciated that one. Like in that process, but it was about knowing that my protection isn't found in my strength. My protection is found in the shelter of the Most High where his strength is seen and known. And this is what the psalmist wants us to see that there is a place of protection, and it's the presence of God. Here's the second thing the psalmist is communicating to us, and that's this, that there is protection from unseen evil. There is protection from unseen evil. L look at verse even 7 through uh, verse 13. Though a thousand fall at your side, 10,000 are dying around you, those evils will not touch you. That word touch is actually the word oppress. The evil won't oppress you. He goes on to say, just open your eyes and see how the wicked are being punished. Uh, in our Bible recap this week, or maybe it was last week, we read the story of Elisha. And Elisha was being surrounded by the enemy armies all around his dwelling place where he was living. Chariots and armor and military were all over and he's like he was hanging out and he was chill but Elisha's servant wasn't so chill Elisha's servant was like worried and stressed and was seeing all of the enemies and is like what is happening what Elisha what are we going to do we're about to die they're surrounding us they're going to get us they're going to kill us it's over it's over can I phone my wife please this is all done we're over it's finished and Elisha prays a prayer and he says oh lord open his eyes. Just like Psalm 91. Open his eyes. And the Bible says that the servant's eyes were opened and behind the enemy that had encircled them, his eyes saw the angel armies of God surrounding their enemies. 
and all of a sudden saw into the unseen the reality that was happening. We live in a supernatural world, friends, where there is more going on behind the scene than often what is seen. There is an unseen reality to our world, which is why Jesus taught us to pray, God, don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There is unseen evil trying to steal, kill, and destroy your soul. And the psalmist is reminding us that we can have protection. Jesus is teaching us to pray that we would have protection from this unseen evil. In fact, when we find ourselves in places where circumstances are happening, uh, James tells us to count it all joy when we face those kinds of trials and testing. Now, let me be real clear. God will not lead you to find moral temptation, getting you to act immorally. It's not what God's after. God's not like setting a trap for you. God doesn't set traps. The enemy does. However, the Lord will be the Lord of your life and lead you into moments and seasons where you are tested and you do find yourselves in a trial of, of fire, if you will. And it's in that trial of fire that you will find yourself, your allegiances and your loyalties will be revealed. See, it's in the pressure that what's really going on on the inside of you will show up. See, it's in the moments when everything is going against what you would want it to be in ideal world, how you respond shows you what's really on the inside of you, where your loyalty is. And God will often lead us to that. And James says, when we find ourselves in that place, count it all joy. Jesus says, when you find yourself in that season, like nobody's praying, God, would you lead me into a trial today? I'd really like my faith tested. That would be fantastic. If you'd send some people who annoy the fire out of me, would you just help them move next door, Lord? That's, that's the neighbor I want. Like nobody's praying that. But they show up. Like they're there. The situations come. And Jesus says, when you find yourself following Jesus, loving him, but yet under fire, Lord, deliver me from the evil one. James says it's in that moment that the testing of our faith is producing something good and wonderful and beautiful and good. And he says, count it all joy. Why? Why do we count it all joy? Because that's where he is. And he's in the fire with you, walking with you, and he's where the joy is. This is why we can count it joy when we find ourselves in these places where we can open our eyes like Elisha was praying for his servant to experience and see the spiritual evil that's ensuing. And Jesus is reminding you, even though there are evil forces influencing the reality of life and the reality of things going on, he is almighty and he is the most high. He is almighty and he's most high. If he's the most high, as the scripture is telling us, is it possible there are some who are less high with evil intent for our lives? I believe it, I believe it is. Uh, I was trying to think of a great way to illustrate this, and I think uh, one of the best ways to illustrate it is um, thinking in terms of, of movies. You ever watched a movie, and you're watching it, and you are so deep into the movie? And, like, you're caught up in the emotions that they're experiencing, and it's just, just kind of wild. But then you watch like a director's cut and you realize like what was going on behind the scenes. Anybody ever uh, see the movie Twilight? I know some of you are like, I ain't admitting to that in, in church. There ain't no way I'm saying I watched that. It's all right. Jarrett saw all of them and read all the books. Um, I mean, just saying. It's what he told me this week. I want you to take a look, take a look at this, this short little clip and, and check out what's going on kind of behind the scenes, what we don't always see.
just like in the movies that we watch, there's more going on behind the scenes than what you're seeing on the screen. In the reality of our world, there are things going on behind the scenes than what you can see at times. And the psalmist is saying, in those moments, there is protection. Now, I'm not saying every time something happens to you, like there's a demon hiding under every rock and every nail that gives you a flat tire. Like, I'm not... Now, like, everything that happens, like, every time you sneeze, like, it's because there's a demon inside of you. No, you just have some allergies and need to take some medicine. Like, it's really all right. We don't have to go, like, wild in all of these things. But we also don't need to be ignorant of these things. Some of the biblical language for some of this unseen, we we already said it, that he is most high. It's a Hebrew word there called El Elyon. In other words, there are other beings created, human and spiritual beings, that are below and less powerful than Almighty God. Uh, Some that we find in Scripture are like angels. What what are angels? Here in the text that says that God would would, uh, command angels to protect you. What, What are angels? Angels are messengers who have human appearance. Messengers sent by God for an assignment and a task. Angels do not have wings. Angels do not have halos. They're messengers and spiritual beings that have some resemblance of a human. The Bible talks about cherubim. What what are cherubim? Well, first, Contrary to Valentine's Day, cherubim are not babies with harps that shoot arrows of love at anybody. It's not a cherub. What is a cherubim? A cherubim, according to the Bible, are these animal mashups. A face of an eagle, a body of an ox. These kind of like mashup of creatures that have wings And primarily, cherubim are in the dwelling place of God and are protective, guarding the very presence and throne room of God. There are a kind of cherubim, animal mashup, that the Bible uses this word seraphim or seraph. A seraph is a breed or a category of a cherubim. These are fiery or shiny serpent-like wing mashed up creatures. The most famous seraph with a name is what we would hear of the name Lucifer. This fiery serpent-like creature that can talk is first seen in Genesis, in the garden. Fallen, rebellious, full of deceit. In biblical language, these unseen, in the unseen realm, these creatures that exist, the Bible talks about things like scorpions and snakes. Look at the, the passage here. It says, um, start in verse, verse 9, if you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the most high your shelter, no evil will conquer you, no plague can come near your home. He's going to give angels charge to protect you wherever you go. They're going to hold you up with your hands so you won't even put your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions. And cobras, your fierce lions, and serpents will all be under your feet. This is biblical imagery and language for things in the unseen of a malevolent um, intent. Evil intent. Evil that is unseen. Uh, All through scripture, birds of the air, beasts of the fields, lions, snakes, scorpion, all terms used to personify and illustrate evil force at play. This is why in Mark 16, Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit comes and lives on the inside of you, you can handle and trample upon snakes and scorpions and poisonous things, and it's not going to harm you. You're going to find protection. What was he not saying? He's not saying grab a real snake, show it on stage, and then watch God protect you. Not what he's saying. He's saying when the evil one and all of his cohorts in the unseen realm are trying to wreak havoc in your life, you will have a power from on high 
through the Spirit of God to protect and overcome what the enemy is trying to do in your life. When Paul was right, or excuse me, Peter writes, and he says that, um, that the enemy, Satan himself, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for who he can devour. He's like a lion. He's not a real lion. He's just like a lion. And he doesn't really bite. He just has a a loud bark. He's just a little kitty cat with a megaphone. Because when you get a peek behind the scenes, what feels like a real lion coming at you, when you see it from God's vantage point, it's just like computer-generated little noises and sound effects, and God's power is greater and bigger than all those things. This is what the psalmist is trying to help us understand. When Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness in Mark chapter 1, he was being led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. What does the next verse say? It says, he was among the wild animals, the beasts of the field, birds of the air, that sort of a thing, and the angels took care of him. Protection, covering, Ministry. So, so then the question is, well, does that mean like I have a guardian angel? No. God does. God has angels that he sends on assignment for specific things. And when protection is needed, those who are dwelling under the presence and authority of God in their life, God says, I'll send angels to protect you. Do you have your own guardian angel? I don't find that to be biblical. Angels go on assignment commanded by God, not commanded by you. In fact, Jesus was tempted in this way. This is what Satan tempted me. Put him up on top of the temple during this temptation period of 40 days. He was on the temple. Side note, what is the temple? The temple is the place where God dwells. And Satan comes to him and says, hey, if you jump off this place, you can command the angels and they'll rescue you. In other words, if you leave the protected place where God lives, surely God will protect you based on your command. Jesus rebuked that and says, no, no, don't you understand? We're not to test the Lord. The Lord tests us. And the test is, will I stay under his authority or will I live in my own autonomy? And it's there where there's protection from the unseen from the enemy. Satan was trying to get Jesus to give up his loyalty to the Father and to take command in his own authority. And Jesus was like, nah, dog. I only do what my Father tells me to do and I'm living under his authority in this place because protection is found under the authority of God because under the authority of God means that we're living in the presence and the person of God. We're living under His protection, not living according to our agendas. Here's the third thing that the psalmist tells us, and that there is a promise of ultimate protection. Ultimate protection. That's talking about the end of days when the world comes to its end as Jesus returns. There's ultimate protection available for those who have lived their life under the authority of God, who dwell and abide in the secret place, and the shelter, who abide, abide, ab- abide, as Jesus said. Look at Psalm 91. Look at the last three verses. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I'm going to answer. I'll be with them in trouble. I'll rescue them and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. This idea of salvation comes from another word to understand salvation. We hear salvation and we think forgiveness of sins. Don't we? Like we think salvation, we think forgiveness of sins. This word salvation actually means deliverance. Deliverance from what then? From the evil one. 
from the work of the enemy. This ultimate promise of protection, this, pro this promise of an ultimate protection that comes at the end is the promise of ultimate salvation when Jesus returns and he removes every bit of evil and all of the demons and hell and all of those things are burned up and thrown out for good and he creates heavens and earth new again and there's resurrection life that fills us and we ourselves are united with him forever without sin, without the pain, without the pull of the enemy, without the very presence of sin anymore. We are with him and there's ultimate salvation deliverance from something. This idea of deliverance, uh, a great word picture the Bible gives us is in Exodus. In fact, this is what Peter references when he talks about this kind of salvation. The, the references in the Exodus where the children of Israel had been slaves under Pharaoh. And God had set them free and they were no longer slaves to the evil they were on their way to the promised land. They were on their way out. And as they get to it, they get to the, to, the, to, to the river. And they're like, um, it's either the army or we drowned. Pick your poison, friends. What are we going to do? And God's like, hey, there's another way. Moses stretches out his hand. The Red Sea holds back the sea. And the children of Israel walk across on dry land. And, and guess what happens next? All of the evil was chasing after them. No, 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 you're not really going to change. No, 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 you're not really going to get a new heart. No, 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 you're not really going to be born again by Jesus. No, 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 you're not really going to be set free. No, 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 you're going to be the same old person stuck in the same old sins and the same old habits doing the same old things all the time. You're not really going to get set free. You're not really going to experience change and freedom. No, 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 you're going to be stuck. You're going to be stuck. And what happens? The waters close in, and the enemy's drowned, and they're delivered. It's the picture of water baptism. It's not just some pretty little, yay, you got all wet in church. It, there's a spiritual component at play where the evil that has surrounded and defined you and enslaved you is buried in the waters and new life has been delivered as you experience the salvation of the Lord. And he gives you his Holy Spirit instead of all of the evil things that had filled your life and heart. This is what it looks like to be marked and sealed for the day of redemption. And he's saying, with long life, I'm going to satisfy you. That's not a promise that you're going to live 120 years. Well, like it's a promise. I'm just standing on the promise. I'm going to do this. Well, are you stewarding the body God gave you? Or are you hoping to circumvent your poor stewardship with his sovereignty? It doesn't work that way. It's not what this verse is saying. This word long life, this idea of long life is this same understanding of a perpetual life. Eternal life. Life that begins speaks of past, present, and future, not just the future. With long life. In other words, with the very life of God, with the very Holy Spirit, God wants to give you his spirit, imparting as a gift given to you the reward for the, the, the response of God of giving you the spirit is a response to your full love, a loyalty, and allegiance, and trust in the person of Jesus. To receive his spirit is then to be marked with the spirit instead of marked by the spirit of the world and the enemy and the ways of the world. So now I'm marked by the spirit, not marked by the beast of the world. And ultimate salvation belongs to me as I will stand before the Lord. And in that way, understanding that the evil one trying to, to, to steal away what God has done in you, the, God's like, no, 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 you don't get to snatch them out of my hand. There is a security of the promise of the ultimate protection because they're dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. Their love and their affection is fully on the Lord, not a divided heart where they've got one foot trying to follow Jesus and the other foot trying to please themselves. Unable to move 
no, no, no. It's, it's I'm going to rescue those who, who love me, who have given their fidelity and their loyalty and given their affection to me, who, who have said my trust is not in my ability. My trust is not in, in the world system. My trust is not in a political power and the right candidate get put, in, put into place. My trust is not even um, in, in um, my trust is not even in my good Christian thought process. My trust is not in my name, but in his name. My trust is not in my circumstances all aligning and never experiencing sickness and never experiencing pain and never experiencing trial. My trust is in his name. It's his salvation. It's his deliverance for me. My name, my trust is in him. Here's the question. Are you living under God's authority? Or are you living by your own autonomy? Hoping God will protect you because you've got a verse that says he's going to protect you wherever you go and you go and do whatever. Nope. God's protection is in the place where God dwells. So are you dwelling with God or are you dwelling in your own way, in your own autonomy, in your own ways, in your own understanding, in your own righteousness, in your own strength, in your own preference, in your own comforts? Or are you living under the authority of God? Are you living under the authority of God? Are you living in your own agency, your own autonomy, your own agenda? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. The protection, oh, God protects. God, God provides it. He's with it. He, he protects us from the unseen evil. He protects us from the trouble that we're experiencing. He protects us ultimately in salvation and deliverance and, and experiencing the renewal of all things. All of those are true, but the question is, it's for those who are under his authority, who bear his name and his way put their trust in him whose loyalty is on him who have an undivided heart for him who aren't trying to like play the field a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of fun life doing what I want we just kind of live with the shuffle the American shuffle I'm a, myself, Jesus what I want to do, Jesus getting drunk on the 4th of July, repenting in church doing what I want with my money, coming to church and loving Jesus. D d we just, this is not the lyric and the rhythm that God's called us to. The rhythm and the lyric is, Lord, you're the most high. When I walk through the fire, you're there. What else could I want? What else could I need? Like, there are other distractions and other things I could fill my life with, but God, it's just you. I don't even need to be right theologically. I just want to be right with you, Jesus. Like, here it is, Lord. I'm not trying to prove my, my smarts. I'm just trying to be present with you. What else could I want, Lord? What else could I need? Where else will we go? Who else has the words of truth? God, it's you and you alone. We will not put the test, the Lord our God, but him only will we serve. Would you stand with me? Here's the question. Are you living under God's authority? Or living in your own autonomy and agency? Are you living in your own agenda? Or his authority? The end of the song. Of another in the fire. There's the last verse says... There's no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was 
and is still and will be through it all. So come what may in the space in between, in between of my giving of his allegiance, my allegiance to him, and in his return, come what may in the space of that time, all things unseen and its reckoning, I know I will never be alone because we're living under his name. Not ours. His name, not ours. His authority, not our autonomy. Would you bow your heads? Would you just ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, is there an area in my life where I'm living under my own authority and not your authority? thank you that we can abide in your presence. We can abide in right relationship with you. And where you are, there is joy. Where you are, there is strength. Where you are, there is protection. And the enemy cannot steal, kill, and destroy. Because we're living under your authority. So Lord, help us live under the shadow of the Almighty and say, you are our Lord. Our trust is in no other. Lord, here in this moment, as we recognize maybe there's an area in our own heart where we're not submitted to you, Lord, we just take a second and say, Jesus, we submit to you. We surrender to your name, to your ways, to your authority, God. God, thank you for loving us. God, thank you for being present with us. You don't have to show up, but you show up. You don't have to give us your spirit, but you did. What an amazing gift of your abiding presence inside of us as we surrender to you. Lord, help us this week to live faithfully, loyally, full allegiance, not bowing down to anyone else, including ourselves, but living under your authority. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Hey, two things real quick. Number one. Uh, three things. Number one, if you need prayer, we have a team. We'd love to pray with you. Whatever's going on, you might be facing some storms. Like We'd love to just pray with you. Number two, water baptism is coming up later this month. If you've never walked through those waters and walked that out and experienced that and gone public and allowed the Lord to deliver you in that way and have that encounter, I encourage you to do that. It's coming up this month. You can find information on our central hub. And number three, this, this month, month of July, triple dog dare you. Fill our ears with worship and our minds shifting to him. Amen. All right, here we go. Up on the screen, we end our services speaking blessing over each other. Nice and strong. Can you speak it out? Ready, go. May the Lord bless you. And we love you. Have a great Sunday. I really hope today's message was life-giving. As a church, we want to help you encounter God and take another next step in your allegiance to Jesus. I want to ask you to take a step right now, in fact. Would you just share this message with a friend? Maybe post it on your social, text a coworker the link. Just be sure to include something that you learned or how it impacted you personally. When you do that, you get to be a part of seeing faith come to life in someone else. And don't forget to visit our central hub, faithchurchks.org. 
You'll find other next steps that you can take in your faith, including giving and partnership with us as we help others encounter Jesus like you've encountered him. Hey, we love you. And until we get to hang out again, remember, don't shrink back from your faithful allegiance to King Jesus.